Hey there, everyone. Happy holiday season. This is Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist at StockCharts.com here in a rainy Redmond, Washington. You know, as we get to year end here, we've got some special programming. If you've not caught it yet, make sure you check out our top five charts of 2023 that aired in mid-December. Really went one by one through what I saw as the top five sort of key themes that defined the year 2023. Went through each individual chart and then sort of supported that with different evidence. Talked a lot about market leadership, breadth conditions at extreme readings, the dominance of the Magnificent Seven, the resurgence of small caps, interest rate environments, and the Fed in 2024. A lot of good charts and insights to share with you. So make sure you check that out uh, on our YouTube channel. We also have our uh, uh, market outlook for 2024. I had a really cool conversation with uh, Miss Schneider of Market Gauge, Jeff Huge of JWH Investments, and Julius DeKempner of RRG Research. We had a lot of fun talking about a number of different things to keep in mind. Seasonality, you know, outlook for the Fed going forward, what interest rates mean in terms of the short-term versus the long-term trajectory, really where their heads were at given the extreme overbought conditions and rally phase that we have here in November, December, leading into uh, the new year, what sort of things they're, uh, they're expecting. Some interesting thoughts in terms of cryptocurrencies and leadership, the return of value, maybe small caps and other things as well. So make sure you check out all, our, all of our year-end uh, special programming for sure. All right, as we get on here, this is a, an all mailbag edition. As a reminder, we always have the mailbag open on the final bar. Uh, one of the great pleasures of doing this show uh, during the year uh, has been hearing from all of you. Feedback on our show has been super appreciated, but we really love hearing your questions. Helps us to think about what uh, you are running into, what sort of challenges you're facing, and what questions you're trying to answer, literally, as you, uh, as you use technical analysis to, uh, to try to trade these markets. So our email is the best way to get questions to us, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. Please keep your great questions coming uh, in the new year. We look forward to uh, tapping the mailbag a lot more in 2024. So we'd love to include one of your questions on the air. With that in mind, let's get to question number one. Dave, do you ever use shorter term moving averages like the five day MA to get a sense of short term movement uh, on a chart? I really like this question. And, you know, as you as you probably have seen, those of you that have been watching the show for some time here and, you know, we're, I think we're, we're now over four years running the show, which is pretty awesome. Um, you know, when you think about uh, my default chart, right, it sort of looks most of the stocks or ETFs I bring up, I usually start here and then we'll bring in some other indicators if necessary. And that's how I found most uh, investors, mo certainly most technical analysts kind of approach things. You kind of have your go to chart, your default chart, and you have other things that maybe help, you know, uh, gather evidence or help you to complete the story or complete the mosaic when you're trying to describe a particular uh, setup, particular chart. My go to chart has the full quote on the top, and that's important because I always want to know when they're going to report it. earnings, which is a feature that uh, our development team just added uh, earlier this year. Quick look at valuations, market cap, dividend components, scooter rankings. These are all things that just help you make a high-level assessment about what this stock has meant, right? Where are we at in the earnings cycle? How is it done relative to its peers? What about growth versus dividends and, and all of those sorts of things? So great sort of starting point. And then I have the daily bar chart and the 50 and 200 day moving averages. Those are my go-to and I, I, I mostly use those moving averages uh, to answer your question, but I'll get to it in a second. Then I have RSI and relative performance or relative strength at the bottom. So I use the 50 and the 200 day moving averages and I've used this combination for, for some time. And, you know, for me, I was convinced that this was the right combination for me after spending a bunch of time with institutional investors. And what I have found, I spent a ton of time with very technically oriented investors running funds, really using charts as a primary input. And I spent a lot of time with a lot of people that were not big chart people, um, but thought of technical analysis as one of those sort of nice ways of complementing their fundamental or their quantitative, their macroeconomic approach uh, to portfolio management. But everyone that I just described, whether they were very technically oriented or not so technically oriented, they all seem to bring up charts with the 50 and 200 day moving averages. And they, they especially knew where the 200 day moving average was. And I learned that from spending time on buy side trading desks. Now, these are the guys that actually and women who actually fulfill the orders. Right. So they get an order to accumulate Home Depot or Disney. Then their job is to get in at a good price. Right. And, and get a good execution for the order that they've been instructed to uh, to take or the position they've been instructed to uh, to take or or unwind. 
they always knew where the 200 day moving average was and, and would often expect this sort of movement, right? If it's below the moving averages, you also find a bounce off of it. You often pull back to a 200 day and bounce. And so that was uh, super helpful for me. And, and I just, the moment I saw how often that, how much that they knew, they had an awareness of it. I wanted to have an awareness of it too. The 50 day moving average comes from a couple different things. And a number of different disciplines include that 50 day or 10 week moving average. And William O'Neill, especially uh, in uh, Investors Business Daily World, uh, talks about the 10 week moving average pullbacks to a 50 day, which I, I find a really good uh, general approach uh, to accumulating over a long term upswing. Now, you, you had mentioned short term moving averages. You know, it's funny. Years ago, I remember meeting this is probably 20 years ago. I remember meeting with a, 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 a hedge fund trader in New York, and he swore by this combination, the five and the 20 day moving average. And his point was, all I'm doing is trading swings in these moving averages. And what would happen was you'd get signed kind of these choppy periods where you weren't making a ton. But then these big swings is where you would make a great amount, right? It's, and so choppy periods would be less profitable. But this, look at what a great trade that is, right? Buying here and selling there. And that was, you know, here you're long early November and you're staying long. You're short in mid-September and you're covering in November. So the when the market is tr in a trending phase, you just have a brilliant return, you know, brilliant P&L. When it's more choppy sideways, it's a little more challenged. Um, so if I was more looking at a swing trading time frame, I would probably use a shorter term combination, not just of the moving averages, but also of things like RSI, right? A 14 day RSI, I think, is really more designed for medium term, long term positioning. If I'm short term, I'd be looking at a nine bar RSI and or a five bar RSI because you're looking more for, um, you know, for quicker swings, right? You're looking more for mean reversion. If you look at what happens if I dial the period from 14 down to five, you can see how the RSI is less trying to get the overall structure and more just trying to pinpoint some of these shorter swings, right? So I think with any of the indicators that I show you, you have to remember that I'm going at this trying to answer the question I'm trying to prim primarily answer with my time frame, which is looking a couple months down the road. So the things that I use are really to help me think about one, two, three months down. If your time frame is shorter, I would encourage you to experiment with shorter periods on moving averages, on indicators like RSI, uh, on any of those uh, on any of those metrics. And that's the beauty of technical analysis really is a fractal uh, relationship of short term cycles to very long term cycles. The indicators can be adapted and just tweak some of those settings and, and again, find the combination that's going to help you. And if you're wondering what those settings are, as we get to question number two, what I would say is look at a chart where you really think it was a good example of the type of chart and think about the levels at which you would have wanted to buy and sell ideally. Then look at the indicators and the configuration on those buy and sell points. That's your combination you want to look for. Question number two, what is the Russell 2000 as in growth, value, et cetera? You know, we talked about this a little bit in our uh, top five charts of 2023. Um, and one of the charts that I showed, not to steal the thunder from that one, but was looking at this one, right? So if you look at 2023 from December of last year to where we're at here and now uh, late December, you know, the NASDAQ 100 up about 54%, the S&P 500 up about 26%, small caps up 17%, the Dow up 15%. Now, what is this really telling you, right? If you think about what these, the, the trends here and just the fact that there's such a spread between the NASDAQ 100 and the Dow, and the NASDAQ 100 is up about 40% more. I mean, tripled the upside return even more of the uh, of the Dow or of the uh, of the Russell 2000, it all comes down to how these benchmarks are, are are designed, right? So if you think about the Nasdaq 100 and the S and P 500, they are dominated by the mag the uh, mag mega cap stocks, right? The Magnificent Seven. So Microsoft and Apple are huge weightings in both the S and P and, and especially the Nasdaq 100. So those two names, just because of the market cap, when you get to bigger names, the 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 uh, weight in the benchmarks is ex is exaggerated, right? The weight is so exaggerated because they're they're so much bigger, uh, and so one movement on Apple is the same as you know a hundred other stocks having a movement further down the cap cap tier, and so you have to. Remember that's it. Now, what are the what's the uh, what are those mega cap names? How would you describe them? Well, they're all growthy, right? There are sectors like technology, communication services, 
and consumer discretionary, right? And, and all growth oriented names, uh, growth oriented sectors. So the NASDAQ 100 is the most, most growth weighted ETF. I think technology alone is probably 50% of the NASDAQ 100 would be my, my, uh, my guess based on where we're at right now. With the S&P 500, technology, communication services, still the two largest sectors, but less dominant than in the NASDAQ 100 because you have other names like banks and others that, uh, that have a little bit of weighting, but it's still very growth heavy. When you get to the Dow Industrial Average, it's a little more broadly representative of different sectors. It's a little more balanced in terms of growth versus value. So when you have a year like 2023, when growth stocks have been dominating the and have had so much, such better returns, this is the return profile you're going to see. So getting to your question, the small cap uh, indexes uh, tend to be a lot less growth oriented. They tend to be in other uh, sectors. There's you know, financials that are heavily weighted, industrials, energy materials are a much bigger weight. Um, so anytime when you see like materials and energy doing better and financials, you'll probably see small caps outperform. And it's less that investors are getting riskier and buying smaller names, although that's something that's often inferred by that. A lot of times it's just based on which sectors are doing well. And I think when small caps have really outperformed, it's less about small caps being so great. It's probably because the mega cap growth names are taking a bit of a breather. So if you think about what happened in October, November, uh, you had names like, um, you know, Apple. Uh, sorry, I'm thinking like September, October. Right? So these sorts of names, you know, pulling back. Uh, but other sectors are actually holding up a little bit better. And as a result, small caps actually really start to outperform and, and regain some of that lost, uh, the, um, uh, the underperformance from earlier in the year. Uh, and it was less about small caps being so good, even though they were doing fine. I think it was a lot of the mega cap names uh, pulling back quite a bit. So with the benchmarks, yeah, the, the small cap uh, indexes, uh, the S&P 600 and the Russell 2000, uh, just lessen those growthy sectors. The other thing to remember is what you have to remember is when any anytime a really successful growth company starts as a small cap stock, the success means it's no longer a small cap, right? It gets upgraded to the mid cap index and it does even better. It gets upgraded to a large cap index. So so a lot of times the top performers actually get out of the Russell 2000 and move to higher indexes. It's another whole dimension of indexes you have to uh, have to remember. Question number three, dollar sign VXN measures NASDAQ volatility. Dollar sign RVX measures the Russell 2000 volatility. Does crossing the 20 level with these two indicators have the same meaning as when the VIX crosses 20? Um, that's a really, really good question. I appreciate the uh, the thoughtfulness of that one. Um, you know, so we, ref we refer often to uh, to the VIX, of course. And, and, you know, for me, this is sort of that main go to measure of volatility. A couple of different ways to kind of gen you know think about volatility in the equity space. Um, just looking at average to range, um, uh, looking at an actual historical volatility uh, and, and, or and then looking at an implied volatility. And the VIX is basically an implied volatility using index options. So it's looking at the volatility in S&P options and then using that to make assumptions about the volatility of the S&P 500 uh, itself. Um, the VIX, of course, finishing the year down in the mid low teens, which is very low relative, obviously, to the last uh, couple of years. We're at the lower end of the range here, and and indeed for long term history, kind of at the lower end of the range of the uh, of the VIX. And I think one of the great warning signs to look for in early 2024 would be a spike in volatility, which we've certainly not seen uh, here recently. So, you know, I kind of highlight this 20 level. That's that blue shaded area, because for me, that's what I was taught. The back of the envelope reading is above 20 is volatile or high volatility. Below 20 is low volatility. And that's why the spike in October, but it never really pushed much above 20, was kind of a telltale sign that it was a short lived pullback that was probably near its end. And when it came back below 20, that sort of confirmed that we were rallying off the lows in a pretty good way. Now, as you pointed out, there is also a VN, that's not it, dollar sign VXN, I think it is, right? So this is uh, the VIX for um, the uh, NASDAQ 100. And then we have dollar sign RVX, which is uh, the VIX for, uh, for the Russell 2000. Um, I don't think I would actually put those put that claim of 20 as being the main level, to be honest with you. Um, and, and to be totally honest, I haven't spent a ton of time with these other vo uh, volatility indexes. There's also a VIX of the VIX. I think it's VVIX. 
or VIXX. Yeah, here we go. So this is the the VIX of the VIX. So it's volatility of volatility with some people who use that. I it's on my rainy day list to uh, to go through some of these and think about talk to some um, you know friends in the industry about about how they would interpret some of these options, additional options, data points. Um, for me, just the VIX alone is the is the main one to uh, to use. I think what you'll find in general, though, is the Nasdaq is a little more volatile, and you can just see that from the fact that the range over the last three years, while the um, the regular VIX, for lack of a better term, uh, has often gone you know sort of range between the low mid teens up to the thirties. If you look at dollar sign VXN, we've really not. I mean, we're sort of down in this range here. But before that, like back in 2021, we never really got much below 20. And we spiked up into the 40s a little more. So it's like the range is just is different. Um, so I don't know if I would use that same back of the envelope uh, level. My hunch would be the VXN would be a little higher and that the Russell's volatility is probably similar to the S&P's. Um, but that's just a guess. I, I would have to dig into the data a little bit more. And, and if any of you do do a deep dive in those and have some thoughts, let me know. The final bar at stockcharts.com. I'd love to know what you come up with uh, with uh, with those. Next question. Can you please explain the Arval ACP plugin? It, I will be more interested if you could explain the interpretation of this plugin as to what additional information it brings in. Yeah, there's a whole um, set. If you look to plugins, there's this one, two that you need to install for sure. Uh, as a stock charts member, the advanced indicator pack, which includes, um, you know, percent from moving averages, roots to, and the um, uh, TTM squeeze, two indicators that I think are, are pretty interesting. And then the relative volume um, indicator pack well, just came out earlier this year. And it's really, really interesting that it's this panel at the bottom here. Let me stretch it out so you can see what it is. Um, so what here's what here's what you're looking at. Right. Arval 20 SMA one. Here's what that means. The one just means the baseline is one. Um, so we're basically saying if the level is at one and, and we're, there's basically no bar and we're kind of flat, that means that the volume today is basically at that 20 day simple moving average of volume. Right. So if you look at something like like here's TTD. Right. So if you look at TTD and I'm just doing this on a different screen so you can you can see what I'm doing. Um, and let's say uh, volume. So here's the daily volume rating, right? So every day we can see the um, the volume and then we can also tell you what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to put it as an indicator below like this. And then I'm going to say overlay a moving average and make it like a 20 day moving average. That's like a one month moving average. All right, so here at the bottom, let me get rid of these other ones. Sorry, I feel like I'm making this way busier than I need to, but it's your question. All right, here we go. So here we have volume, and then in blue is the moving average. So basically, if the volume is right at the average volume for the last month, for the last 20 days, then um, that percent a volume is going to be kind of flat. That's that's kind of this period, right? So we're at the 20 day average volume. If the bars are very high, that's going to be a day like this where you're way above the average volume for the last 20 days. And so that's why the uh, the indicators up here. As a matter of fact, on that particular day, you're about six and a half times the normal daily volume based on the last month. And that, if you caught how I was describing it, is what you were doing. Basically, you are tracking what is today's volume or looking back on any given day, what multiple of the average volume did experience on that day. So if the bar here is around three and a half to four, that means you had three and a half to four times the normal volume. Up on these big days, it was about six, six and a half times the normal volume. You can kind of get this by that previous indicator looking at uh, you know volume and having a moving average, but this sort of standardizes it a little bit. And when you glance back, this is and Trade Desk is a little uh, weird because you had these big spikes in volume. Some stocks don't have that exaggerated of a reading, uh, but if you look, basically um, you're um, you're tracking. Um, to see when, you know, what, what, how much of the normal volume you have. And you know, also lighter volume, right? So here's about half the normal volume uh, here at the end of December, which makes sense, kind of a holiday period, less volume, choppy market. And so you were about uh, half the normal times volume. You can set all of that. So if you click on the header, you can change what you're looking at. So if you want a different moving average type, if you want to change it, and I do it on ratios because I'm thinking of the time. You can also do a percentage, which would mean, all right, it's 200% the normal volume or something like that. 
Um, but uh, but the ratio is what I what I kind of like to uh, like to do. So just an easier way of just saying, all right, what what's today's volume versus the um, the normal volume for this particular stock? And it's a way to glance back and focus on actionable moments, right? When is something happening uh, that you really want to be aware of? Let's get to the next question. What is your opinion on the OBV indicator? This is on balance volume. My The short answer is I'm a fan. Um, it's one of those things I probably don't use nearly as much as I, as I should, um, but on balance volume I found is pretty interesting. I don't look at volume a ton, as you probably know, and that's more just a you know, my own experience with the technical toolkit, there's only there's only so many things that you can consume at any given time. And so one of the decisions and I think probably the most important decision you need to make as a technically oriented investor, it's not which indicators you should use because um, because that often is pretty easy. You'll find a lot of things you want to use. It's more important to decide on the things you don't want to use. Right. What can you just push away and not worry about? Because then you're simplifying your toolkit. I think that's tougher for a lot of uh, a lot of investors to do. I would encourage you to to uh, subtract and not add as much as possible uh, and, and just refine your toolkit to the things that are really helping you answer the questions you're trying to uh, to ask. So, you know, on balance volume was something Joe Granville created uh, years and years ago, and it basically was a way of looking at volume trends over time. Um, so, you know, compare this to just looking at regular volume where you're basically just saying, OK, on any given day, how many shares were traded? Here, you're actually stringing together those daily volume ratings and positive uh, closes, up closes, that's net positive volume, down closes are net negative volume. And so you're looking at the trend in volume on ups and down days uh, to look at trends in volume. It's a very simplistic and easy to calculate, and I would argue probably under um, developed indicator. I would say some of the indicators Mark Chaikin created, like the Chaikin money flow and accumulation distribution, I think build on what uh, Granville did, uh, but think a little bit more um, thoughtfully or think a little bit more um, appropriately about what volume on a given day actually means. So with those indicators I just mentioned, like Chicken Money Flow, you're actually looking at where the stock closed in the range every day and then using that to calculate a cumulative volume rating. So if I was using an indicator based on volume, I would probably go to um, some of Mark Chaikin's improvements. Accumulation distribution, a number of our, our stock charts co uh, commentators use, and chicken money flow. I think they're both uh, very, very interesting. Next question. Many technical analysts have an almost religious belief that gaps will be filled. Do you agree? I have very few uh, you know, religious beliefs when it comes to charting. To be honest with you, I, I've learned to have a, an open mind about a lot of things, but maybe that um, some people are way more dogmatic than uh, than I am. Um, you know, gaps, I, you know, so I was going to bring up the QQQ is great because you have this gap right here recently. I, you know, I, that whole thing of gaps need to be filled. I don't think so. Uh, and, and because what, what that, when you make a blanket statement like that, you're, you're, you're ignoring the fact that different gaps have different purposes, right? So when you look at the chart of the QQQ, this is what you would call a breakaway gap or an initiation gap, I like to think of it. So, you know, when you have a new trend, you often have a gap in the direction of the trend. That that doesn't necessarily need to be filled. That's a gap that's just an upward thrust. And you have so many stocks right now that gapped higher and have just continued to go um, higher and higher. Like a firm, is that the name I'm thinking of? No, Adobe. Which gappy name am I trying to uh, to think of? I'm not going to come up with it. There's a stock recently just you know gapped higher and just continued to go higher. That I can't come up with it, but um, you know so that those sorts of gaps I don't think so. Now other gaps and sort of like a um, you know a mid trend kind of gap, a continuation cap as you might call it, often do get filled. And that's sort of that gap in the middle of a trend that tells you there's sort of a reset. You can see here we pulled down and, and sort of tested that as support. I don't think of gaps, by the way, I don't I don't like that that whole idea of saying they need to be filled. I don't think I think gaps being filled, I don't think that's the way you should think of them. What the way I think of gaps is they are support and resistance ranges, right? So when I see a gap, what I immediately want to do, and I either do this mentally or I do it literally with a shaded a rectangle like this, is just think of that gap as support and resistance and not as a line. It's not like the upper end or lower end of the gap are the level. It's the range. It's this area because when we hit that gap, people know, right? People see on the chart, okay, there's the gap. 
is it going to hold or not? And I think a lot of times that becomes a really crucial moment. So the QQQ, the SPY holding that gap and then resuming the uptrend, pretty bullish. So um, so no, I do not have that almost religious belief that gaps will be filled. I would say think about the different types of gaps. right? And the other one we didn't talk about is an exhaustion gap, which happens often at the end of a movie. You have a big run trending higher and higher than this big last gasp higher. So each one of those, I think, are very different. If you want to learn more about gaps, whether you hit the magnifying glass and look for the chart school article on gaps, it's actually really good. Next one. On December 13th, the Dow Jones Industrials made a new all-time high, but it wasn't mentioned on the final bar. Why not? What's going on? Um, thank you so much for that question. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so it's funny, right? Uh, and and uh, to be honest with you, yeah, th- I think you're looking back uh, back here, right? When we made a new all-time high, I probably didn't mention it. So, you know, it's funny. Yeah, here, here we go, right? Take, taking out the 2021 20, high. Um, indeed, it did. Here's the thing. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is not a great index. It just isn't. The, the reason why we track the Dow to this day is uh, two reasons. I would say number one for historical reference, right? This is sort of generally accepted as kind of the first benchmark. Now, back you know, in the early 1900s, benchmarks really weren't a thing that people talked about as much, you know, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, and this whole idea of indexing and indexing and, and mutual funds, all of that came much later. Right. So so we now think of things in terms of benchmarks uh, and certainly institutional investors that did back in, you know, uh, uh uh, Jesse Livermore days, right? Like our bucket shops in the, in the 1920s. None of that was a thing, right? It was just about individual stocks and, and, and stuff like that. So the Dow Industrials and the Dow Railroads were two, you know, sort of the first indexes that were kind of widely reported and followed. So I think from a historical perspective, it's cool to look at where the Dow has come from. And so if you're looking at a real deep dive, to be honest with you, and I think uh, if you go to our historical chart gallery, which is um, awesome, by the way. I always lose this. Where is it? Historical. There it is. Historical chart gallery. Go to important market indexes. Dow Jones Industrial Average from 1900 to present. How cool is that, right? To look back 123 years and look at the history of, uh, of equities in the U.S. And there are other indexes that you can track before that. The Cowles Index and the Cleveland Trust and others that actually did them uh, back to the 1700s. I've seen databases. I know at the Fidelity chart room, we had stocks back to the late 1700s, kind of the birth of, of equities in the U.S., um, with that in mind, um, you know, so so that I think that the historical value is what is what's uh, number one. Number two is because the media loves reporting the Dow and it's a big index or it's an index with a big value. So when it hits 50,000 or 10,000 or whatever, that's like a headline. What does it really mean in 2023 that the Dow Jones Industrial Average is making a new high? I would say not much because the members of the Dow are not super representative of the modern economy. Back in 1930, they probably were because they were 15 big, you know, industrial companies or whatever the number was. And now it's 30 kind of a mix of companies. And it is interesting, but some of the most important names that you probably think are really important for the markets are not included in the Dow. Um, so the S&P 500 is really the main benchmark that most institutions would follow. It's a better representative, a better representation of the modern uh, um, uh, economy and, and the modern stock market. Um, so the S&P is, is kind of the benchmark of, of record. Um, many institutional investors are either benchmark to the S&P, meaning they have to outperform it. And even if not, they'll always kind of have a sense of where that relative to the S&P because so many assets are tied to passive products and index funds that are tied to the S&P, right? The SPY and other things like that. The Nasdaq has become more and more of a meaningful benchmark. The Nasdaq Composite and the Nasdaq 100, um, the QQQ, of course. So the fact that there are uh, ETFs that are traded on those so widely is certainly helping as well. So yeah, I but the fact that the Dow makes a new all-time high, I mean, that, that's a headline, but is there substance behind that? Not really. Um, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq making a new all-time high? That's meaningful. So the S&P nearing 4,800, that's something I've been talking about and will continue to push through. The Dow making a new high, as much as that is a thing that's happening with the index, I don't think it's a great indicator of the markets in 2023. It's more for uh, historical reference than uh, than anything. Uh, But you are right. It did indeed make a new all-time high. 
Last question that we got to wrap here. Hey, Dave, what would you recommend to people who are keen on catching falling knives? Oh, I love this question. What a, what a way to finish the year with the mailbag with a question like this one. Um, how long do you have to wait before jumping into a beaten down stock? And yet you had a lar- larger question that you uh, that you wrote about, uh, you know, I don't want to get burned again by something that's not ready to turn around. So, you know, I think with the chart of Pfizer, which you particularly asked about PFE, I think this shows the danger of buying falling knives, right? And, and if you think it looks like a good buy candidate here for whatever reason, um, and, 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 if, and if a main part of that reason is because the price is so low, what you have to remember is looking back, there are a lot of points on this chart that look a lot like the current point in that it keeps going down, right? I was taught, and this is probably when I was convinced to become more of a trend follower than a contrarian was someone told me prices go down for a reason, right? When Pfizer's going from $50 a share down to $28 a share and almost getting cut in half in value in 2023, that's not just a fluke, right? There's a reason, right? Something's going on. And you want to buy companies that are thriving, that are growing, that are doing well. And the price going up is one of the best indicators that that's kind of what's happening. Or certainly that investors are pricing that sort of opportunity in going forward. So I think the challenge for uh, for a chart like PFE is that you're early, right? And and when you buy falling knives, you often get cut, as yeah, to continue that analogy, to its uh, to its painful and bloody end. Um, so having said that, what can you do? So I would say if you are buying falling knives, and, and I would not I would not proudly announce how you like buying falling knives uh, because that has more of a negative connotation. I would encourage you to describe yourself as more of a value-oriented investor, which I think is totally fair. And I've met and, and known uh, successful investors who have made a career out of buying beaten down names and, and just and, pl- and, and just getting paid when they reverse aggressively to the upside. Uh, and, uh, and and there are times and, and just the, the reality is certain times in the market cycle, those types of things tend to work and other times not as much. And that's just the reality of the cyclical nature of the uh, of investing. So what are the things? So, so a couple things I would say. Number one, what you need to do is remember that a big part of your approach has to be money management. Right. So if you're buying severe weakness, you have to be prepared for further weakness before you're proven right, right? The, um, and I forget who was quoted with with this one, but somewhere I have this quote written down that you know your goal is to be proven right down the road, right? Proven right later. You don't want to be, you know, as a contrarian, you don't want to be with the crowd today, but later you need the crowd to be agreeing with you because that's what's going to push the price high. That's how you're, the price of the asset's going to go up is if other people agree with you later, right? So you're buying in during weakness and expecting an improvement, which means you either have to be okay with losing 10, 20% of your investment before you gain 200% or you just have to you know, be looking for the right combination. And if it doesn't work today, you get out. Um, Tom DeMarc is probably the contrarian that I worked with the most. His indicators, TD Sequential and TD Combo, are contrarian by definition. It's all about finding exhaustion points or looking for established trends that are then reversing. Um, but built into his indicators, like Sequential, there was a buy point, a trigger, and then there's a built-in stop. And his comment was, look, if the price doesn't do what the indicator said it should do, and if it just completely ignores it, it keeps going down, whether it takes a certain number of bars or it hits a certain price threshold, depending on how you want to do it, you just get out of the position, right? And it's just, that was wrong, move on. And so you're going to be wrong and just accept that. Uh, it's okay to be wrong. It's not okay to stay wrong, as one of my mentors uh, used to say. So something like Pfizer, you may have been buying earlier and hopefully you have some sort of exit strategy that we broke down below some level and you unwind the position. You may be wrong, wrong, and then eventually you're, you're proven right. So what kind of things do you want to look for? Things that I'd be looking for on the chart of Pfizer, and of course, perfect example because it didn't work here, but September, October, something like a bullish momentum divergence um, often is something I would look for. I'm thinking some of the banks, right, had these, yeah, like Bank of America. This is what it usually would look like, right? October, November, lower lows. Um, RSI higher lows, that's called a bullish momentum divergence. That's one thing I would look for as a way of anticipating a bottom. So you don't want to buy when things are just going down. You want to buy, I think, when there's a sign that the trend is exhausted. So lower lows on higher momentum. Um, And I think this one, Bank of America in October of 2023, one of the best examples I've seen in some time. Uh, And again, you're buying here, assuming that you're going to be proven right. And and indeed you were. So, you know, uh, bullish momentum divergence, 
divergence, that's one thing I would look for. Testing previous support levels, right? So the problem with something like uh, Pfizer is you're nowhere near previous uh, support. You've just blown right through it and gone lower and lower. So names like a lot of the banks traded down to a previous low. And that's where you can assume if investors, if, if falling knife investors bought back here, they're probably going to buy here when it's probably around the same valuation. And so looking to the left and identifying key support levels, whether it's on price support, maybe a, a Fibonacci relationship, a key Fibonacci level, a big round number. Those are things where you'd often find um, uh, some sort of uh, some sort of support. Um then the last thing I would think about is, you know, wait, look for some sort of confirmation. So if you are buying, let's say you bought Pfizer today, right? Think about what would you need to see to convince yourself that you were right, right? That you did buy at a good point. And I would argue that's more of the confirmation, right? Did we break above a descending 50-day moving average, which we failed to do here for 12 plus months? Does the RSI push above 50 and, and often push above 60, meaning we're no longer in this bearish range or more of a bullish range? Does the relative strength start to turn up, right? So it's anticipate the bottom, take the position with good money management, and then have some validation that you are right. And if anything breaks down, in that in that sort of pattern, you unwind and find another uh, find another opportunity. Those are some of the things that I would keep in mind if I'm doing more of a value oriented or as you would call it a falling knife approach. Folks, that's it. A lot of fun with this mailbag. I can't thank you guys enough for sending in such thoughtful questions. I really appreciate it. Going forward, we'll certainly keep the mailbag open. We've talked a lot about uh, you know what we're planning to do with the final bar in 2024, and it certainly involves keeping this mailbag uh, up and running. So send us any questions that you run into as you're trying to use particular technical indicators, as you are looking at a particular chart or symbol and just trying to you know figure out how to approach it. You know, if you have questions on market history or market dynamics or different uh, you know, things that you hear elsewhere, just shoot us an email and let us know what you're running into, and we'll do our best to point you in the right direction. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a great holiday season. We'll see you in the new year. Bye now.